Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Greg Johannes. I'm chair of the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Centre, uh, and I'm delighted to invite you to what is the ninth in our webinar series today focused on offshore wind in Australia, uh, an industry panel discussion. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many, many lands we meet on today in Tasmania, elsewhere in Australia and overseas, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, Leslie, if I could have the next slide. Uh, the CRC, very briefly, is a research partnership spanning 10 years involving 40 participants in 10 countries. Uh, and it's really focused on sustainable offshore seafood production and renewable energy generation. And it's in that spirit and in that research space that a few weeks ago, we launched our offshore wind energy in Australia scoping study report. We were really hoping to launch that uh, in an in-person physical event, but of course didn't have that opportunity as a result of COVID. So there are a number of things we want to do to follow up. And one of those is today's webinar, which is really having a detailed discussion with the people out there on the ground, working with the technology and making the investment decisions to understand their perspectives on the opportunities, but also the challenges that have to be overcome if we're going to realise the potential for offshore wind. So, Leslie, next slide. Uh, our speakers today are drawn from a cross section of organisations. Uh, I'll speak briefly to their experience and to their role within their parent organisations. Uh, and you'll see that we've got a fantastic set of expertise to draw on. Uh, if I can just, by way of some housekeeping, before I get into the introductions, uh, ask you to do a few things. Firstly, to ensure that attendees can see both the presenter and their slides. Can you ensure that your screen is on speaker view? Uh, secondly, really encouraging you to use the Q&A function to pose questions as we go. We'll be pausing at the end of each of the presentations for five minutes or so of questions and then returning at the end of all of the presentations for a bit of a panel discussion. But if you can pose those questions as we go, I'm sure our speakers, if they have the opportunity, will, uh, will answer them in the chat box. Um, uh, I shouldn't say chat box because, of course, the other thing I wanted to say is only use the chat box if you're experiencing technical issues or you have a direct question to any of the panelists that you don't want to include in the Q&A discussion. So as, as far as possible, use the Q&A function to pose your questions. So if I can move on to the next slide, please, Leslie. So our panel today includes uh, David Karaskoza from SciTech Offshore, Aaron Coldham from Star of the South, Andy Evans from OceanX, Dan Hansen from Green Energy Partners, Brad Lingo from Pilot Energy, and Tim Sawyer from Flotation Energy. So I'll introduce each of them in turn. I will make uh, one observation as a CRC though, and that is we've been able to put together what we think is a fantastic and authoritative panel to offer some really interesting commercial insights. Uh, but what we recognize as a CRC is we need to lead in the space of diversity. Um, and in future, we'd like to see an even more diverse panel set up than perhaps we've been able to provide for you today. And that's really an issue that at the CRC we're committed to working on through our programs. Um, and so we expect in future that you'll see even more diversity on our panels. So with that, I'm going to move straight into introducing David Karaskosa. David is the Director of Operations at SciTech Offshore Technologies, uh, and they're a partner company and participant in the Blue Economy CRC, focused on developing floating offshore wind solutions. David joined SciTech as an offshore engineer before later becoming the head of the offshore wind department and then taking on the chief technology officer role. And from June 2021, David holds the position of Director of Operations and is part of the board of directors. So David, over to you. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you very much uh, also to the Blue Economy CRC and for the organization of this uh, a very interesting webinar. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Next slide, please. Yeah, can, can we move into the next slide? Yeah. 
Exactly. Okay. So yeah, just just uh, a, a very a very quick um, word about about SciTech of technologies, which only was was very well introduced by by Greg. Um, we are let's say a, a company that works in, in the uh, in the floating wind energy field, and, and the the company actually born uh, with the ambition to to provide a competitive solution to this to this market uh, based on first say using concrete as, as a key uh, material for for the for the innovation uh, where say not only the the competitivity of, of the, the let's say the, the cost capex and opex against steel is a key advantage but also the, the local content in, in its production uh, it's a completely innovative and disruptive uh, geometry and, and technology, including plug and play uh, solution and, and a very innovative approach in terms of the, the sea keeping, sea keeping system. In any case, we'll, we'll, we'll have some, some more time to, to discuss about the technology if, if uh, interesting afterwards, but we thought it was a bit more interesting to uh, say to look at the, the key project we, we are developing at the moment, which is the, the demos of Next, next slide, please. And then to introduce this project, uh, we'll, we'll play a short video. Uh, so if we can play this one, Leslie, please. I'll, I'll comment on, on this one, because I, I guess you're not hearing the, the sound. It's a project located uh, north of Spain. You might see the, the, the video a bit, a bit chunky, but well, it's, it's probably bandwidth uh, issues. In any case, it's just a representation of the project and, and some key features will, will be shown. Uh, it's a huge milestone for, for us, but also for, for the country, as it will be the, uh, the very first floating offshore wind, and actually the first floating offshore wind turbine connected to the Spanish grid, and, and one, one of the very few in, in Europe and, and also worldwide. Uh, I mean, this market is increasing, but kind of, are kind of the, the pioneers in, in in Spain, and it's it's actually uh, this this know how the, the one that we, we would like to to bring to, to Australia, um, and, and that's why we are involved in, in this blue economy CRC. Uh, in the following slide, we will see just a, a few key uh, key figures for for the project. Two megawatt is, is the, the rate of power. Uh, that means more or less uh, generation of uh, electricity to uh, to actually cover the the, the needs of uh, more or less two two thousand households yearly. Uh, Seventy five percent of of the capex for this project will will the local content in in the area of fifty kilometers around Bilbao, where, where the, the platform is is being built. Uh, it will be connected to a, an existing test center to two miles offshore. And the depth uh, of the, the location is 85 meters. And as I said, it's, it's the, first, uh, the first platform that will be connected to the, to the grid in Spain. And I'd like to acknowledge also the, the participation of the, the key role of RW3 as, a, as an enabler for, for the project and, and a partner throughout it. And then let's say for the Next slide, we'll, we'll see a, another ESO video, which is just an, an update on, on where we are uh, in terms of the, the project itself and, and how it's, it's evolving. Hopefully, when, once the, the, the link uh, is shared with a record, uh, we'll, we'll see. So, Leslie, yeah, if you can play the video. We'll see. This one is a bit less chunky, but... Okay. Here we are. So uh, this is a very, a very short, short piece to uh, let's say provide a, an introduction of where where we are in, in terms of the the construction of uh, the floater. Um, yeah, it looks like it's not working very well. Uh, in essence, we we are uh, we are well advanced into the construction of the, the floater, uh, which will will follow uh, 
pre prefabrication uh, method. As, as you will see, we, we are, let's say, previously, uh, we, we do build several slices and sections of the, of the floater that uh, following this phase will be assembled and, and let's say assemble all together in, a, in an onshore operation. So everything is onshore. The, the, say that the construction of all the, the different segments and, and sections will, will be done on, onshore, also the, the assembly of the, the turbine and the tower. And then once, once this is done, uh, the, the whole system, the whole assembly will be, will be then um, launched and, and finally towed uh, back to the, to the, uh, the test center where, where this one will be installed. Then yeah, we'll we'll be sharing these the, the link of, of this video uh, where you will probably see this this one better and yeah, mindful of time. Let's let's step to the to the last slide, uh, which is actually a, a, an interesting comparison uh, we usually do in in our speeches in, in Spain, where let's say football is like um, I, I would say. Uh, our, our first sport in, in Spain, and then comparing the platform towards the stadium is, is probably a, um, something that's in the mind of, of everyone. This is not the, the platform we are, we are building in, in Bilbao, which is a two megawatt platform. This one would, would be a, a 10 plus megawatt platform, but it's, it's a good example of, uh, uh, let's say, getting an, an understanding on how, how big these, these things are. And, and how challenging um, putting, let's say, in the sea, uh, a, a few dozens of, of these units um, will be. And, and, and it's it's not it's it's not only challenging but also a, a great opportunity for for a market like like Australia. And I'm I'm sure that my my colleagues and, and the other panelists will will provide a bit more insight into into what's the the opportunity here. So that's that's all from from my side. Thank you, thank you very much, Leslie. And yeah, happy to to answer any any kind of question that that will will arise afterwards. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, in Australia, we frequently measure things in terms of uh, the equivalent in size to our Melbourne Cricket Ground, which is of course one of the very famous and very big stadiums. So. Uh, that last graphic you showed really resonated with me because that is often how we talk about things in terms of Olympic sized swimming pools or the Melbourne cricket ground. So I've had a, a number of really interesting questions come in. Uh, some of those are, that are quite technical and specific and it'd be great if you have a chance to, to look at those. Some of the more general ones that I thought would be useful to explore with you include uh, this question around social acceptance. So you've shown it's a, it's a quite a it's quite a prominent system. Uh, you deploy in some cases in close proximity to the the coastline. How have you dealt with that issue of social acceptance? Well, it's it's a it's a very it's a very good point as uh, social acceptance is, is probably a challenge that mainly onshore renewables are are facing in, in Europe, and and then. Let's say that offshore renewables are are getting like an as an easier path uh, to to the social acceptance because I mean it's 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 not your backyard uh, it's it's like uh, obviously it's, it's it's something you need to to deal with uh, but it, it's it's like if we if we need to select uh, having let's say a, a wind turbine over the the mountains, uh, let's say, in, in your landscape, or uh, let's say, 10 to, to 15 kilometers away, uh, then probably you, you will select the second option. In any case, uh, this testing we are we are doing uh, is, a, is actually a demonstrator that will be located two miles offshore, but that's because the, the test center itself uh, is located two miles offshore. It doesn't mean that we are planning to, to install wind farms uh, so close, and and actually the let's say the, the first commercial development deployments that, that are are being um, uh, that that are being planned um, here in in Europe, speaking uh, 
say, distance, distances to the shore of about, uh, say, 30 to 40 kilometers. And, and therefore, the, the impact is, is quite, quite low in comparison to the great benefits and local content and, and development of the, the local economy. Fantastic. That, thanks, David. Um, another theme that's come up is around uh, the ability of the system to operate successfully in a more aggressive, higher wave energy environment that we envisage in some cases around the blue economy, as opposed to more coastal locations. So uh, what's the, the company's level of confidence around the ability of these systems to work in more aggressive natural environments or is this the sort of area in which you need to invest more research and development effort going forward? Well, I should say that the, um, the location where we are going to install this these system, which is this north, uh, north east coast of, of Spain, is quite harsh. Uh, I mean, the, the significant wave height uh, for a 50 year return period is about 11 meters. So between 10 and 11 meters. So that means we'll, we'll see, we, we, we potentially will, will see waves of up to 18 meters, uh, which is, I think, not, uh, maybe uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to find some, some sites a bit more harsh in, uh, in Australia. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm for sure convinced of that one. But if we see some, some other places like the Bass Strait and, and some others, uh, well, I think we, we will be, uh, we will have a, a technology well proven. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, David. Lots of great questions coming in. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, in the interest of time, noting we've got a, we've got a full panel, I'm going to, to move on now to introduce our next speaker, Leslie. So if you can give me the, the next slide. So our next speaker is Erin Colden. She is the Chief Development Officer on Australia's first offshore wind project, Star of the South which is seeking to harness Bass Strait winds to power more than a million homes with clean energy while creating thousands of jobs. Erin's responsible for the project's development activities, working with industry, regulators, policymakers, and local communities to bring offshore wind energy to regional Gippsland in the state of Victoria. Um, she was included in a world, uh, a word about winds top 100 women's power list of 2021 and is a real champion for female talent in the energy industry, driven by the positive opportunities that offshore wind represents for Australia. So Erin, really looking forward now to hearing from you. Great, thanks Greg. And thanks everyone for joining us here today. I'm um, really delighted to be here doing one of my favorite things, which is talking about offshore wind. So thank you to the Blue Economy CRC for putting the spotlight on this wonderful technology. Um, before I get into my presentation, I also want to say how fantastic it is to be here as an industry. This is the first time uh, that I've come together with a panel of other developers looking at offshore wind in Australia. Uh, I wanted to give a particular shout out to one of my fellow panellists, Andy Evans. Uh, I wouldn't be in this position today if it wasn't for Andy and his co-founders in getting Star of the South up and going. And I'm so excited to hear more about Ocean X and the work uh, that you're doing together with Pete off the coast of New South Wales and continuing that pioneering spirit for offshore wind in Australia. Uh, so in terms of my presentation today, I look, I normally start uh, with why, why offshore wind? It's something we were talking about a lot, but I don't need to do that today. The Blue Economy CRC has put out a wonderful report that summarizes all of that. And for those of you who missed the webinar a few weeks ago, I do encourage you to check it out. It was fantastic. Uh, so instead, I'm going to use my time here to give you a little overview about Star of the South with a particular focus on what it is we're doing right now and how we're going about developing this offshore wind industry and uh, hopefully paving the way for other developments to follow as we go along. So on this slide here, you can see for those who haven't heard of Star of the South, we are located in Gippsland off the coast of uh, places like Yarram and Port Albert being the main towns there. And we're exploring an area uh, through a license that was granted to us by the Commonwealth Government back in 2019, a 500 kilometer squared area off the coast. Uh, we also have an onshore component. So we often talk about this being two projects, one being the offshore wind farm, the other being the major transmission link that would connect us into Gippsland and the Latrobe Valley 
was a very, very strong connection point into the national electricity market. Uh, in terms of the distances, you can see there between seven and 25 kilometres off the coast. And we are exploring quite a large project up to 2.2 gigawatts. And up to 200 turbines is what we're looking at at the moment. We're still in the realms of selecting that turbine, obviously with the advancements of technology. Uh, and no doubt there'll be some questions on that we can take a look at. Uh, before I move on, who are we? Who is it that's developing this offshore wind project? First of all, to acknowledge our investors and funders, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners. We're so delighted to have their uh, not only their financial backing for this project, but the technical expertise they bring as global leaders in offshore wind. But we've also grown quite an important local team here. And you can see us there, uh, you know, outside being COVID safe. So we've grown to about a team of 30 or so that are really working hard to progress this offshore wind project uh, here off the coast of Gippsland. Next slide. Thanks, Leslie. Now, before we sort of go into what's the look ahead for Star of the South, I'm sure um, many of you have heard of us, it's also important to look back. So, you know, in Star of the South, we often have a saying that we're working together today to build a better tomorrow. It's not just working together as a team within our unit, but working together most importantly with uh, governments who have a regulatory and policy view of how the offshore wind sector should develop, uh, with traditional owners who are a critical part of our project, with local communities, uh, with unions, which you can see some pictured here, some representatives there out at Gippsland, uh, as well as media to get the story out and the message out. And the people like the Blue Economy CRC, it's not something that industry can do on its own. So we really do need to work together, uh, no matter what our role is in the system of bringing a new industry forward. And I could fill many, many slides uh, with photos, with uh, the journey so far, but I've picked a few of the, the favourites that really highlight what it is to set up a new industry and to keep that going. I'm particularly proud of the photo there of Susan and Stella, our local staff at Yarram. For us, that's what it's all about, creating opportunities in regional Victoria, uh, from day one, from the development phase, all the way through uh, to construction and operations into the longer term. Next slide. So what is it that we're focused on right now? And boy, it's a lot. Uh, we've got a little timeline here. So there are some pictures, but just to touch on some of the significant milestones that we've ticked off on this project. In 2019, as I mentioned, we were granted an exploration license and that really kicked off our investigations out at sea. So we've had wind and wave monitoring equipment out at sea uh, for the best part of two years. We consulted on site investigations and during 2020, uh, continued those studies out at sea with geophysical campaign to analyze the seabed conditions. We've got sea depths of 20 to 40 meters. So we are looking at fixed bottom uh, foundations, which are suitable there. We also started a marine ecology survey program, which has pulled together some of the foremost researchers and scientists, not only locally here in Australia, uh, but also from global industries to ensure that we've got a good understanding of the marine environment as we start our studies. One of the major milestones uh, was working together with regulators on the scoping and referring our project under existing environmental legislation so that we can get on with the important assessments. I did note that one of the questions that came up recently was around, um, you know, how can an offshore wind industry be done in a way that minimises environmental impacts? And it's critically important to our team. Uh, we now have scoping. We've got about 25 technical reports that we will be preparing and presenting to the authorities over a number of years uh, based on our assessment of how offshore wind can be built in our unique environment here in Australia. Uh, too many to go through. Uh, the transmission route was another big process for us over a period of 12 months, but perhaps moving on to the next slides. What I wanted to show here is just the breadth and depth of those studies. So, uh, as I mentioned, 25 technical reports. Within that, the marine ecology is one aspect. So we're doing a significant amount of research. Uh, we've got boats going out, we've got planes in the sky every month, we have tagging going on. And these are just some of the images of what we're seeing out in Bass Strait right now. So we've got high definition cameras and LIDAR technology that's detecting bird heights. We're looking at whale species. Um, and perhaps the next slide. 
tracking. So we're tracking a, a range of species, seals, birds, and you can see where it is that they're traveling. So it's really important for us as a team to make sure that we are setting a strong benchmark for the industry and really paving the way for others to come forward in terms of how these assessments are done and accepted in an Australian landscape. I think I've got one more slide because um, I know we're on a time limit today. Uh, but essentially, we do see this as a real opportunity for regional Australia. Uh, it's no secret that offshore wind around the world has transformed coastal communities where there have been industries in decline. Uh, so in Gippsland, we know that there's 100 years of power generation experience. There's a significant amount of experience from the oil and gas sector. So we are really driven by finding those opportunities, starting with the Gippsland region, uh, rest of Victoria, Australia, New Zealand and internationally. Uh, so I wanted to give a shout out today for those who haven't registered for us. Um, if you're within the supply chain and you want to get involved with Star of the South, it doesn't matter if you're a big multinational or a small local business. We really encourage my call to action to you is to register at our industry capability network gateway. So we do have a portal there if you search for it. Let us know what you do and how you want to be involved. And we look forward to having those conversations with you. Just like we have with some of our partners and, and just to give a shout out, I think some of them are on the call from Tech Ocean and Acrocean. Uh, it's a beautiful story for those who don't know, but bringing technology from France, the wind and wave monitoring equipment, bringing people out there to train local workers in South Gippsland on how to maintain and manage that equipment, uh, upskilling the local industry. So we're really delighted recently to be shortlisted for an award uh, around industry collaboration for that piece. And that's a commitment we seek to make throughout the whole stage of the project is finding those opportunities and making sure that benefit and offshore wind knowledge is growing here and uh, hopefully making that easier for projects to come. Look forward to uh, addressing your questions in the Q&A and thanks everyone for your time. Fantastic. Thanks, Erin. Again, uh, great online engagement, lots of questions coming through. Uh, one really interesting one that I've seen is this issue of other users. So I think people quite often assume that because they're standing on land and they can't see users out there that there aren't existing communities of interest. But of course, there's oil and gas industry, recreational fishers, commercial fishers. Uh, you've talked about those that are interested in migratory species. So how have you gone about uh, identifying those other users out there, including commercial users and engaging with them? And what sort of response have you got as a potential new entrant into that uh, area of geographies that, that they haven't seen before? Yeah, great. Thanks for the question. It is a really big part of the work that we do. So at Star of the South, we know that our project will be better developed, uh, more accepted and more successful ultimately if we have that engagement with other users of the sea. So uh, not only the sea, but as I mentioned on land with the, uh, the transmission component of our project. So from an early stage, um, going back to when the founders first developed this project, there was a lot of engagement, particularly with the Gippsland community and uh, whether that was fishermen who were using the waters or uh, the local ports authority to be able to paint that picture of who was uh, involved or interested in this project down to local communities uh, and everyone in between. So. I think what's really fantastic is uh, the Commonwealth has recognised that as a principle of the regulatory framework that it is seeking to introduce uh, so that ensuring when the industry does come along, there is that engagement with other users and recognising that coexistence is a core principle of how we'll need to operate. Uh, naturally, there's issues we might need to work through uh, where there's conflicting use and particularly in construction phases and so forth. But it's about, first of all, getting to know who's in your backyard, uh, getting to know your neighbours so that you can have that conversation uh, once that relationship is established and you understand what the issues are for those people, what the impacts are, how they're actually using that space and what an offshore wind farm would introduce into that use and how you work around that. So uh, certainly I think there's some work to be done. But for us, that is a core part of this development phase of the project. And it's why in some way, uh, it's good that we've got the time to do that properly uh, and, and contribute not only our local knowledge of the Australian landscape, but equally uh, the international experience from our colleagues who have worked uh, for years in markets like the UK and Denmark, uh, emerging in the US, so that we're taking those good lessons and implementing them here in Australia. Fantastic, Erin. Uh, just uh, one more question before we move on again in the interests of time. 
Uh, you talked about engaging the regulators or potential regulators. And of course, this was a, a key issue that came out in the work that we released a few weeks ago is the absence, particularly in Commonwealth waters, of a regulatory environment. And so I'm interested in those, in those discussions and in the engagement you've had to date, particularly around uh, environmental approvals and associated planning assessments. In your experience, have there been particular touch point is issues that seem disproportionately more important in the eyes of regulators? We've seen some public commentary recently, I think as recently as the last day or two around migratory bird species. Um, of course, there's a lot that we just don't know about uh, in terms of the underwater environment. Are there particular issues that you think, boy, that's going to be a really important one for the industry generally going forward? Yeah, I think um, if I look at the data and not just from regulators, but from what the community is telling us and our own experience of developing big projects, certainly those sensitive environmental species are ones that are going to have to be thoroughly investigated and understood so that first of all, we can understand what those impacts are and how we can minimise them. And when we talk about those species, it's typically the, the birds and the marine mammals, such as the southern right whale, uh, where the numbers are of concern. So certainly uh, there needs to be a spotlight on those issues. I think more broadly, uh, I was reflecting with some colleagues recently that uh, this is the first time an offshore wind project has been proposed and, and developed in Australia. Uh, so it is a new issue for regulators to deal with in terms of what are the studies that need to be done and what is the correct jurisdiction? Is it the Commonwealth that takes the lead or is it the state that takes the lead in this particular instance? Uh, so that's some work that we've been doing over a number of uh, years, really. And I think that going through, as I say, there'll be 25 technical reports looking at all issues ranging from social benefits, uh, such as job creation, uh, as well as the impacts right through to those environmental assessments, uh, fishing and navigation. So uh, certainly from the data that we're seeing so far, the main topics of interest for people, particularly local, uh, are around the local species, but equally, uh, what are the jobs? What is the economic benefit that could materialise from offshore wind? And how can that be laid out in terms of those assessments and the benefit that could be derived for those communities? Fantastic, that's great. Thanks so much, Erin. So now let's move on to our next speaker. Leslie, if I could have the next slide. So now we're gonna hear from Andy Evans. Andy is a co-founder and the chief executive officer of OceanX Energy. And they're a developer of large scale offshore wind energy projects located off the coast of Australia and New Zealand and the associated land-based infrastructure that's required to deliver energy to market. And Erin gave us a bit of a soft introduction to Andy when she mentioned their, their previous work in the context of Star of the South, because Andy was one of the co-founders and the inaugural CEO of Star of the South. So Andy, over to you. Thanks, Greg, for the uh, kind introduction and also to Erin as well. Um, look, firstly, I'd like to really congratulate the Blue Economy CRC on what can only be called a seminal piece of work. I know when Peter and I and Terry Callis formed the Star of the South in 2012, I think there was one 10 page academic paper um, that looked at offshore wind uh, as a potential energy source for Australia. And there'd really been nothing to really go on. I think one of the great things we've got now looking at the panel of speakers today are experienced people, not only from Australia, but globally as well, who've been around and been doing this sort of work or related work for a long period. So it's a, it's a really encouraging sign from where we were nine years ago. Just as a really quick introduction, just to the OceanX team, uh, look, uh, met obviously a number of people who are on this call over the last nine years, um, probably more the last five to six years where there's been a lot more publicity about offshore wind. But Peter and I set up uh, OceanX about 18 months ago, mainly based out of more of a fascination to start exploring floating foundation opportunities, which really exists off the coast of New South Wales, um, West Australia, but also into New Zealand as well. Uh, and I'll get into it a bit later in the slide. We're really looking at technology that can be deployed with water depths of 50 metres or greater. Um, so with that development over the last few years, and as we've seen with, with David earlier, what SciTech have been doing in the last few years, it really creates a great opportunity for Australia and the rest of the world. We'll just move on to the next slide, if we could, please. Leslie, thank you. Look, Peter and I are usually very uh, transparent around what we're actually proposing. Uh, we were lucky enough to get a good bit of media about three or four months globally, which flowed back here to Australia around our projects. When we sat down, it was about five years ago, we looked at mapping out Australia and there could have been up to 20 projects that we identified uh, to take forward. 
We refined that at the start of last year to 16 projects and over 22 gigawatts. We've now come up with what we see as our real priority list of projects uh, in no particular order. Um, and looking at it geographically north to south on the east coast, look at Hunter and the Illawarra, probably the lead projects um, in New South Wales. When you do look at those areas and regions, you see not only fantastic wind resource, but also capability of regional industry that's been going for decades, you know, almost a century in key areas such as mining, power generation, port logistics, land logistics, engineering and the like. So we're really blessed, we think, particularly with those projects there, to have those uh, environments and industry support that can really pull off these projects. One of the key points I referred to just on the uh, cover page of the presentation, which is really understated and not quite understood, I think, in Australia, is the amount of investment going into offshore wind globally. Uh, David's lived it firsthand and obviously uh, Tim with the reach in flotation energy and their work they're doing globally. But the numbers which will come up in future slides, which I'll get to in a minute, are really quite staggering numbers that have been robustly tested over time. We are really hopeful and we know that there are international investors as well as local investors which are really attracted to Australia and the, not just the potential returns financially but also the opportunities for regions going forward. We really have an ability to create long-term sustainable industries, um, which do not need to be greatly adapted from existing industries. So that's the path we're on, and we think it's attainable much sooner rather than later. Um, just go on to the next slide, please, Leslie. These are very large numbers. Again, they'll go through a, a number of variations over the years, but they have been ro robustly tested. They're very big numbers to walk into a room, particularly with politicians and talk about without having some backing, but. What we see with the projects we've planned around Australia, almost 10 gigawatts worth of, potentially $47 billion worth of capital expenditure, 10,000 direct and indirect jobs. So that refers to jobs where you are heavily involved during the, uh, the construction process through to a lot of indirect jobs involved in supporting construction and installation. Um, the local content varies very much between projects. I think the really beneficial thing we've seen from David's presentation earlier um, with the SAF technology is the potential for 75% local content. That is a real benefit given the size of offshore wind and in particular floating foundations as well. Um, as with all developers here, we are really focused on local content first and foremost. One thing we've learned over the last nine years, Peter and I traveling around the world, we really are a long way from the rest of the world. So it sets us up really well to create a lot of local industry. Um, and look, and that's been really well received, whether that be in the Gippsland with the Star of the South, um, up here in Newcastle, the Hunter Valley, uh, the Illawarra and Port Kembla and Wollongong, uh, and over in the West. It's a common theme of interest from local industry to be involved. So that's what we're really uh, keen on focusing on going forward. A really great number as well is just that final number. Um, they can vary between permanent ongoing jobs. It's very different to a lot of onshore renewables, which of course we support greatly, where once projects are constructed, the requirements for O&M staff is much reduced. Very different story with offshore wind. Realistically, you're looking on a project of uh, 2,000 megawatts, between two and 300 permanent uh, jobs, which really need to be locally based. Um, a lot of those jobs are either warehouse management or actually going out and tending to turbines out in the ocean. So fantastic local content opportunities. I'll just move on to the next slide, please, Leslie. Just to give everyone a bit of an insight as to what we're looking at, this is a fairly generic slide, but most of our portfolio is with the red. Um, the bottom titles, the red footers, looking at the different types. There are three main types of technologies at the moment, a number of other variations going forward. So part of our process, we've had many studies done, certainly on the wind resource, environmental and planning, but we're also looking at um, what sort of turbines and foundations would be applicable and appropriate for the, the regions that we're looking at. Again, given the size um, of these foundations, and I think David used a perfect illustration there, they're very large. They're very hard to barge across the world. So it really lends itself to local manufacturing, assembly and installation. Again, New South Wales, very lucky with two great uh, deep water ports at Port Kembla and also at Newcastle. So we've been heavily engaged naturally with the ports for the last 18 months, trying to understand availability of land and opportunities for related skill sets. Just onto the next slide, please, Leslie. Um, I've put this uh, slide up mainly to show that this is not a new concept for Australia. I think part of the, the challenge you have in uh, 
discussing whether it be with governments, local regions, industries or local communities. This is not an idea that's just fallen off the back of a truck recently. There's been a lot of background to this over the last nine years, particularly with uh, Commonwealth Government as well, when it was first introduced by uh, uh, Terry, Peter and I in 2015. It has gone through an exhaustive process. We're just really fortunate now that we're consolidating more of an industry. You know, we've got bona fide developers here today talking about real projects uh, and real capabilities. So we're obviously encouraging the Commonwealth Government as much as possible um, to really progress forward on the regulatory framework. Um, and to be fair, uh, Minister Taylor has been very good to deal with. We first met him in 2015. So has always been a big supporter of the industry. So if we could get this little thing called a pandemic out of the way, I'm sure the framework would progress much more quickly. Uh, just getting on to the final slide, if I could please, Leslie. Just in terms of the path forward, looking at the projects for OceanX, I mean, obviously we've got Star of the South um, as the real trailblazer. Um, you can see why I stepped out of the project with someone like Erin and Casper leading the project. Um, my role became a little bit defunct. So we've got an incredible team at the Star of the South and they're really gonna lead the way going forward for Australia. But in terms of what we're doing with OceanX, all going well, the key dates for us is realistically, we'd like to get to a final investment decision 2026, 2027, so that we can start a construction of our first project, which we're not stating at the moment that there's a particular project, um, other than say, most likely it'll be one of the New South Wales projects. But for us, these are really realistic timelines. We really um, assimilate what we're doing with offshore wind, with other industries like hydrogen and the electrification of transport. Um, we really see our timelines progressing alongside those industries. We see a lot of commonalities with those industries from the type of investors through to the supply chain and the outcomes. So we're really gearing towards having a really robust industry from 2030 in particular going forward. And if that seems like a long time, well, when we set up the Star of the South in 2012, only seems like yesterday. So time does go quickly. Um, just moving on to the last slide. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, here are my contact details. I mean, as you can tell, it's a challenge for me to sit here and speak succinctly for five to six minutes. Um, I love to talk much like Erin. I'm very big on getting out into the community um, and really engaging with people, hearing from people um, at, at all levels, not just locally. We've been fortunate enough with using David as an example. We first met in 2016. There's a real global industry and brother and sisterhood out there that really want to work on these projects and they really want to see Australia be successful. So please reach out. Um, you can directly email me or call me. Um, I'd be really happy to hear about whatever interest you've got um, going forward in offshore wind. Thanks, Greg. That's fantastic. Thanks, Andy. Again, there's been a, a real flood of questions, which is great. Uh, it shows how much uh, engagement we're getting. Um, what, one of the, the questions that's a reason is a reason in relation to your timelines, um, that sort of 2027 kickoff date. Um, are there things that are missing in the Australian system that prevent you from moving more quickly, like certainty around the regulatory environment? Or even if we had that certainty, would that just be what's required to get a project of the sort of scope and scale you're talking about um, into the water? Yeah, look, certainty is a key thing, Greg. We've been fortunate, we're firstly on Star of the South to get great investors in Copenhagen infrastructure partners. Um, I didn't mention with OceanX, we've got a group called Green Tower who are backed by the Daiwa Group out of Japan and Green Giraffe. I think most of the investment industry are ready to go. We just need more certainty on the ability to start deploying real funds. Um, I think Star of the South, again, have been real leaders in uh, deploying really strong expenditure levels going forward. We're doing the same at OceanX, and no doubt um, the other people on the panel are. Once we get into a, a feasibility process, which is fully blown, you're looking at 200 million Australian dollars and beyond just to get to that final investment decision. Now, you don't make those decisions lightly without a real pathway to know that you can build projects. So we do need certainty around a regulatory framework. Um, I think a few other names have been mentioned. Not only do we have great parties like Cytex, CIP, um, Green Tower involved, but there's already RWE, Iberdrola, Equinor have been here, Macquarie. We've got the parties that are already here and interested in Australia. If we can just get some certainty, we'll have even more investment coming into Australia, which is critical. 
Fantastic. Um, look, an another question that was asked, and it's, a, it's an interesting one, is uh, you emphasize very, very strongly the fact that we're a long way from anywhere else. Um, we've got an emphasis on uh, local content and building work opportunities for the future within Australia. Um, it, do you see competition in future from others floating their platforms in and applying them in the Australian context? Or do you think the distance is so great and our needs are sufficiently different from systems that operate in other parts of the world uh, that really that's unlikely to be a competitive force in the Australian market? Look, there'll just have to be a mix. One, one of the challenges we have with our supply chain is particularly around steel fabrication. Um, so we've got a great steel producer. We've obviously seen issues with steel fabrication and tower sections in an onshore context. Given the size of the floating foundations, no matter which of the three current sort of technologies you see, there will have to be a global mix. Um, you'd like to say you could do everything here in Australia, but we're not of the size of country and certainly developed supply chain to be able to do it. Having said that, I think the real opportunity is on the innovation side of things. Um, obviously, SciTech, one of the real leaders in the floating foundation, but there's a real capability to do a lot of the, the innovation development here in Australia. Um, most of the OEMs in floating foundations are not of the mega, mega size um, that you would see in, say, fixed foundations where you've got two to three main OEMs. Uh, the way floating foundations are developing, they're more the smaller mid-size that will be Reliant, and I think part of their sell point, as David noted, is you can have up to 75% local content. So it lends itself to local opportunities. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, we'll now move on to our next speaker. Leslie, if I could have the next slide. So our next speaker is Dan Hansen from Energy Green Partners Australia. And he has nearly three decades of experience in global infrastructure contracting and uh, of that, uh, over 25 years has actually been in the wind energy sector, mainly with major international wind energy OEMs. He's also worked successfully across Africa, Asia, South America, and the USA. So he provides a fantastic opportunity to hear a truly global perspective on these issues. So over to you, Dan. Thank you very much. And uh, as a speaker, you know, it's, uh, I think it's very opportune to for the CRC to come out with uh, this initiative to make the report. Uh, we as Green Energy Partners, our projects are, are ready to go into the public face. So we, uh, we've been happy to help out and assist and uh, think this is, uh, this is just the start of uh, a lot of news that's going to come. Uh, let's start with uh, who are Green Energy Partners. Green Energy Partners are a network organization that is basically born out of uh, COVID. We are a lot of uh, colleagues around the world that uh, were stuck, and uh, but we're working internationally. So we banded up and uh, made a, a Green Energy Partnership so we could help each, each our, other out in, with uh, various tasks across the globe. Uh, Green Energy Partners has a sister organization called Danish Wind Partners. That's a, a, that's a consultancy company. So where we, we can source uh, resources, very experienced resources from all aspects of the technology scheme that we need. And Green Energy Partners is a development arm of the same organization. Next slide. So one of the big opportunities I see for, for offshore and one of those that can really drive it is uh, that uh, the grid onshore is basically saturated. It's overreach and uh, overstretched. And in order to facilitate the green energy zones which are, are targeted, you know, there's an enormous investment in the grid infrastructure upgrade that is needed. AEMO have identified that uh, there's an investment requirement of 25 to 30 billion in, in upgrading the onshore net. Um, it's the other thing I see is that um, those renewable energy zones, they are a mix of solar and wind. So the average capacity factors coming out of these are relatively uh, small compared to what we can do offshore. So offshore's uh, opportunity is really this, that it can save quite a quantum of the uh, investment in grid because it could utilize the existing grid points 
And secondly, it offers a capacity factor, uh, which is more than double the average that you would get on site. And then it can deliver a massive capacity. Next slide. The, 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 the other side of uh, developing enormous amount of infrastructure onshore is that the social license, as uh, there have been a few questions about, is uh, getting a bit stretched in some areas. So there's not only uh, you know, the visual um, impact of the, there's also the ecological, and there is a certain act called the bio, bio uh, bios, uh, what are called, diversification offset scheme, which is also becoming a major obstacle to do anything onshore. Uh, luckily, there's some that want to re review that one, which I can only welcome. Uh, but uh, offshore, um, we are basically, we will, we will be out of sight, really, uh, to the best of our ability, depending on where we are, the continental uh, shelf is moving in and out from the Australian coastline. So in some areas, uh, it's uh, it there might be uh, some visibility from some high points, but I think we can deal with that. It's definitely, it will be much less than anything that you do onshore. There will be communities that are living offshore uh, and there is also um, this fishing industry, there's uh, the leisure boats and so on. Uh, they will have the full benefit of, of the wind farms offshore, of course, but it's a, it's a matter of education and talking to these people and finding out where the, the common benefits are. And one of the really big common benefits is that everywhere we will go and put in these offshore wind farms, there will be a huge local industry that needs to be developed, which will have a very positive impact for the overall social license. Next slide. The, the other thing is timing. If you, you everybody knows that basically the, the coal fleet is obsolete and they uh, are and, uh, 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 basically falling over every second day. Uh, and there is a schedule for their phase out. So they're phasing out, there's a couple that goes out next year and then to us end of this decade and through the 30s, there's a lot of them going out. In order to, to, uh, to substitute the power that these massive power plants uh, produce, you really need to have a substantial capacity. And that is what offshore has. Offshore has nearly limitless capacity to, to deploy and can really fill up the void that coal uh, is creating by its exit. And also timing-wise, as Andy showed his timeline, that timeline for offshore wind in Australia fits exactly with the phase out of coal, because it takes a long time to get these projects to uh, financially close it into construction. So, uh, so it's it's about starting now, really, in order to to hit the the, the point where the coal is starting to drop off for sure. There's also uh, the opportunity for offshore wind because of the massive capacity that it can create. That is to, to actually deploy much more capacity than required currently by industry and consumers and, uh, and uh, supply the green energy hubs, which are fascinatingly enough, also targeted the same places as the offshore wind farms are targets. Uh, so uh, there's a very good synergy there. Uh, and, uh, and that means that Australia can really produce uh, green hydrogen uh, at substantial quantities in the future. Next slide. So what offshore wind really uh, provides at this point in time is a national economic uh, benefit that is nearly the equal of the snowy hydro developments in the 50s. It's an immense new industry that can be developed under the right guidelines. And, uh, and it also, because it has, uh, compared to onshore where it's a small drip uh, project here and there and so on, they're not that small anymore, but there's, <laughs> they're still smaller than anything offshore. Um, that economy of scale and the timeline of these projects 
means that there is a real opportunity to, to develop a, a local supply chain. It will not be for everything, but there are uh, quite a lot of uh, items that goes into the supply chain, which lends itself. Australia is far away and, and moving them here in, in fully developed sizes is, is costly and difficult. Uh, so the, the scale, uh, both in, in the size of the individual component, but also of the industry, it means that uh, we can finally develop a, a renewable industry of substance in Australia. I've been here for more than 20 years and been involved in quite a few factory developments, and they have all fallen off because of uh, uh, short-sighted policies and uh, the ups and downs of the industry. So getting a framework right from the government, which they are working hard on, and it's from reliable sources in the Federal Minister for Energy uh, office there, they, they, the framework is practically ready to be put to, uh, to uh, Parliament about now. So uh, we hope the best, but it's really an opportunity that's too good to miss for Australia at a grander scale. That was my words, I think. That's great. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, a question for you. You've worked for an extensive period of time in this space. You've worked across multiple continents. Do you see any particular challenges or opportunities that Australia faces or enjoys compared to other jurisdictions drawing on your experience? No, no, it's, it's more or less the same really anywhere you go. There's different drivers uh, in different regions of uh, the globe for, for why, why did Europe starting an offshore wind sector back in the 90s really? Uh, that was an energy security thing. You know, that energy security thing is less of a thing now because, and at the same time, the com industry have become so uh, competitive uh, I was involved in the first offshore wind farms in Europe in 98 and 99, and I was the lead manager for a big project in, in 2000, just before I came to Australia. So it's, it's not a new industry, uh, and uh, it will face the same challenges, but there's a, a lot of experience that have been gained around the globe. Uh, in all aspects of the environmental impact, the impact of birds and whales and sharks and fish and whatever. Uh, so all that comes to our help now. So I think actually, uh, to some extent, uh, nothing is easy, particularly not in development, but uh, there is lots of experience to draw on by now that will make it, uh, that will make good use in Australia. Fantastic, thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm going to uh, move us on now in the interest of time to, uh, to our next speaker. So Leslie, fantastic, thank you. So our next speaker is Brad Lingo. He's the Executive Chair and Director of Pilot Energy, and he has extensive experience in developing and implementing business strategy to create maximised value in the Australian international oil, gas and energy markets. He's held a number of senior executive roles before this at organisations like Drill Search, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Sunshine Gas and Epic Energy. And they've all been focused on developing and implementing targeted business development strategies. So Brad, really looking forward to hearing from you now. I think we might have you on there. There you go. My uh, cursor was uh, fighting against me, uh, trying to get from one screen to the next. Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, you know, why pilot? Um, uh, you know, pilot, when I came in um, early, uh, uh, first half of last year, I was approached by a, a group of major shareholders um, that had invested in a, um, what it more or less could be described as a nano cap oil and gas exploration company with a significant footprint in the Midwest region of Western Australia. And um, uh, I was very much, um, you know, based on my history, um, have had a long um, history of experience and experience in developing new energy industries and energy infrastructure within Australia. Um, but I was on, um, uh, on my own personal journey 
um, at looking at um, the, the need to go from um, uh, the industry that I had traditionally grown up in to an industry that you know, faced the realities of um, our current environmental crisis. And I put it to the major shareholders of Pilot that um, the future of Pilot was not as a um, nano cap oil and gas exploration company, but really um, to recognize the nature of the footprint of the company. Um, next slide, please. And uh, next, next slide after that, since we are a publicly listed company, um, uh, read the compliance statement at your, at your, at your leisure, um, that we were a company with an existing oil and gas business, but the real future of the company was to move into um, uh, a significant focus on um, uh, the development and creation of clean energy. And as I said, the, the history of the company was um, by its nature, the identification, exploration, um, appraisal development of oil and gas resources. And what I put to the shareholders was their real future was that same nature of activities, the identification, exploration, appraisal, but it, development of clean energy resources. And um, since our significant footprint was one of the largest oil and gas exploration tenures off the Midwest coast of Western Australia, I think uh, referring to um, uh, an early paper that uh, Andy Evans referred to um, back around 2009, um, the University of New South Wales um, uh, paper in uh, Wind Power Magazine talking about the opportunities for offshore wind in Australia, um, going back that far had identified um, one of the highest priority areas for the successful commercial development of offshore wind being the Midwest coast of Western Australia. So embarking on that journey, um, first and foremost, what we identified was use and transition from a business focused on oil and gas um, and investment in infrastructure um, and production of hydrocarbons to the redeployment of those 10 years redeployment of that intellectual property, redeployment of that infrastructure um, to the singular focus of the development and production, uh, responsible development and production of clean energy with a principal focus on offshore wind. Next slide, please. So at a glance, um, uh, we are just in the process of completing a um, equity raise today, um, raising an additional $8 million in uh, capital. When I came into the company in um, April of last year, we had a market of cap of about $800,000. We're now sitting at $30 million and with a resumption of trading on the ASX tomorrow, um, uh, we're hoping to very quickly escalate up from that um, back to um, somewhere in the 40 to $50 million market cap range. Um, we are focused on a very large offshore wind development, uh, which we call the Midwest uh, Wind and Solar Project, um, located um, near the port of Dongra, anchored around um, the offshore infrastructure um, for the Cliffhead oil field. Um, next slide, please. So our principal strategy in energy transition and development is to focus on using the existing um, pilot asset and tenure footprint, um, as well as that in intellectual database. Um, uh, going back and looking at the tremendous amount of data that is necessary to um, move through the um, uh, approval and development process for an offshore oil field. Um, in Commonwealth waters and compare that to um, the EIS that you have to do today um, for an offshore wind project. Um, you're probably looking at uh, a 75 to 80% overlap, whether it's the wind studies, the marine studies, the seabed studies. Um, uh, we have that extensive database and experience and that was our principal focus our existing footprint, use our existing um, knowledge 
base and to leverage that into and through uh, the feasibility to permitting process. So um, uh, following uh, recommencement of trading on the ASX, uh, we will be kicking off um, major feasibility studies for the Midwest wind and solar project. Um, and within the next uh, week, we'll be announcing the appointment of those feasibility consultants, many of, many of which um, uh, you'll be quite familiar with, with a singular view of establishing both the technical and commercial feasibility of a major offshore wind development in the Midwest region of Western Australia. Um, with an ultimate view that we are the developer, um, not necessarily the principal long-term owner um, and operator of a large scale facility. So we will be focused very much on uh, going from permitting to partnering and um, having those ongoing dialogue, which we already have with uh, major um, uh, interested parties in participating in that um, green energy development um, through offshore wind. Next slide, please. So focused on our Midwest position, um, here's a very simplified graphic. And one of the things that was identified in that uh, New South Wales, University of New South Wales 2009 um, wind power uh, paper was why is this location so attractive? Well, one, it's clearly um, uh, the wind resource and the quality of the wind resource, the stability of the wind resource. The other major attractive feature is it's one of the widest parts of the continental shelf where um, starting at the cliffhead platform, we're only at about 15 to 18 meter water depth and our existing WA41P um, expiration permit covers about 350 linear kilometers along the um, uh, Midwest coast of Western Australia. Um, and 80% of that tenure is in water depths of 60 meters or less. Um, you can see that mapping in um, uh, Blue Economy CRC's offshore wind report from last week. One of the major attractions is that coincidence in this area of what I call three very significant resource features. One, a relatively shallow achievable seafloor. Two, a rich stable wind endowment. And three, a uh, strong complementary onshore solar footprint. Um, all within close proximity of significant um, onshore uh, uh, transmission capacity um, from our landfall in the area of the Aerosmith uh, oil production facility um, for the Cliffhead oil field. We're 63 kilometers from a 330 kV line um, and a dual circuit um, uh, substation on the grid. Um, in what from a development perspective is a brownfield environment, um, but equally um, one that is uh, um, a, a resource engaged um, population um, that is receptive to um, this form and fashion of development. Um, our view is to bring industrial scale clean energy to um, further enhance that resource endowment um, that is represented by the second largest iron ore export port in Australia, Cheriton, and a site where um, the West Australian government has been highly focused for many, many years on the potential development of direct reduction iron, which in effect is uh, an earlier description of what we now refer to as green iron and steel. Um, largely the same chemical process, all with a view of the production of hydrogen for the processing of that iron ore. Uh, next slide, please. So the Midwest Renewable Resource Zone, um, it's a premium uh, renewable resource precinct. Uh, it has that established infrastructure and um, with the complementary um, high capacity um, uh, industrial size uh, large-scale offshore wind um, that provides a clear hydrogen development pathway. And the Western Australian government clearly recognized that with its call for um, expressions of interest for the Okaji Strategic Industrial Area. 
um, all with the view of looking for 1.1 gigawatts of um, renewable energy uh, strictly dedicated to the development of a green hydrogen hub. Next slide, please. So quite simply, um, uh, our, our view is to um, develop um, the uh, Midwest offshore wind project um, in and around, anchored around the Cliffhead oil platform, which we would look to ultimately redeploy and reconfigure into an offshore substation. Um, we have existing easements and rights away from that platform to shore. We have existing um, uh, 160 hectares of onshore facilities at landfall um, to support um, uh, the uh, offshore wind project uh, coming in from the offshore. Um, and as I mentioned before, within 63 kilometers of the um, uh, existing uh, Swiss um, uh, 330 kV line uh, power grid. Um, ultimately, our commercialization pathways, power to the grid, power um, for domestic hydrogen production, domestic hydrogen and electricity for green steel, um, domestic hydrogen for green chemicals. We can also um, support in a transition um, the production of blue hydrogen through the provision through the cliffhead facilities for carbon capture and storage. And ultimately, um, electrons for export in the form of export hydrogen. Next slide, please. Um, so here are the details of the feasibility study we're in the process of commencing, but I do agree with uh, my other panelists that one of the most critical things um, to the successful development of these projects, and this project in particular, is that close um, alignment and, and working closely um, with both state and commonwealth regulators um, to uh, achieve and establish the right uh, regulatory frameworks and policy settings, um, as well as working with um, the local community, state, um, uh, and other stakeholders um, that uh, want to participate in the project, but also have to live with the project. Um, and so we're very much focused on um, this project becoming a welcome component of the community. Um, and to that end, one of our uh, significant shareholders of Pilot um, is also one of the largest gray fishers in the Midwest coast. Uh, next slide, please. So what is our competitive advantage and why are we so passionate about offshore wind? Well, one, we've got an existing footprint um, that we see is well suited to um, transitioning from its oil and gas history to that of uh, providing clean renewable energy. Um, we have that ownership of key licenses and infrastructure. We wanna leverage those, um, those assets and infrastructure and uh, historical knowledge into the development of responsible development of a competitive clean energy project. And we've got a proven board and management team um, and following our capital raise, we're well positioned to get started on the transition. Um, thank you for giving us that opportunity and I've definitely tried to keep it to the five minutes. Fantastic, thanks, Brad. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll have a little bit of time at the end to circle back to, to a few questions, uh, but I wanna make sure that we get the opportunity to hear from Tim, so if we can move on to the next slide, please, Leslie. Fantastic. So our final panelist today is Tim Sawyer. Tim is the Director of Flotation Energy, a specialist offshore wind developer using fixed and floating platforms. And I think that's quite interesting for us because I've seen a number of questions today talking about the relative merits of fixed versus floating. Flotation Energy was founded in 2018, combining the team's expertise in developing some three gigawatts of fixed offshore wind projects, and more recently, the Kincardine Offshore Wind Farm. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Tim. Uh, so, Tim, over to you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, can you hear me, just to verify? Perfect. Um, thank you to the CRC. Um, Blue Economy for the opportunity. Um, fellow panelists, uh, reflecting what Erin said, 
This is the first time I've been involved in a panel like this in Australia, which is great. And hopefully we can have many more and cooperate uh, on trying to get an offshore industry up and running, uh, building all the good work done to date. Uh, if we go to the previous slide, just from the start, that's okay. Um, I will endeavor five minutes. If I don't, you can throttle me. Um, the photo on the front is a bottom fixed offshore wind farm, uh, fairly standard. Um, uh, as Greg mentioned, I'm director of Flotation Energy, which is a UK offshore wind developer, and Carolyn Sanders is our project development manager in Melbourne. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Flotation Energy is an offshore wind developer founded in 2018 uh, by Alan McCaskill uh, and Nicole Stephen. Alan is probably one of the founders of Offshore Wind. He's been involved in for over 30 years, um, originally through BP and Talisman in the UK. And he developed, um, amongst other things, the Beatrice Offshore Demonstrator, that top left photo you can see there. At the time, this is now going way back 10, 12 years, they were the biggest turbines in the deepest water, the first on jackets and the first to connect to an oil and gas platform. Um, a lot of people thought that was a crazy project at the time, which it was. Um, but fast forward to now, you've got 10 megawatt machines in the water with 15 megawatt machines on the drawing board. Um, foundation types are standardized. And that particular wind farm is now the Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm, which is 588 megawatts. I uh, think still the fourth largest in the world. So from little things, uh, big things grow. Um, Nicol Stephen is ex-deputy prime minister for Scotland and energy minister. So he has, brings a political legal background. Um, the team have a track record of commercializing floating and fixed offshore wind. We, between us, developed about three gigawatts of, of bottom fixed offshore wind that's uh, in construction or operating. And Nick and Alan in particular conceived, designed and delivered the 50 megawatt King Cardine floating offshore wind farm. That's the largest floating offshore wind farm in the world to date. Uh, and I've got one slide on that a little bit later. Um, but to address that point on the relative merits of bottom fixed and floating, there's 112 megawatts of floating installed now. Um, there's some 30,000 megawatts of bottom fix. So there's a big gap there, but one that we hope floating will accelerate um, with deployment and come down the cost curve. Uh, more recently, we've, we secured 480 megawatt bottom fixed wind site as part of the UK round four auction early this year in February. Um, we've got a lot of offshore wind projects going on globally. Those little dots represent some of our projects, uh, both bottom fixed and floating. And we're pioneering the energy transition and that applies really to um, decarbonizing and diversifying the interest of oil and gas. Um, that comes out of half the company being from oil and gas backgrounds and half uh, from offshore wind. Uh, headquarters are in Edinburgh with subsidiaries in Australia, Taiwan and Japan. Uh, an important point just quickly is that we are technology neutral as a developer. So we don't really partner with specific technology providers. Uh, we prefer to maintain flexibility, which means we can go to the market for the best solution. Um, next slide, if you could. Um, so just very briefly on King Cardin, just because I find this hugely exciting. Um, it gives you a view of where offshore wind is going. Uh, bottom fix is the preferred solution today and it has 30,000 megawatts or more worldwide and has come right down the cost curve. Um, if you can do bottom fix today, you would. Um, floating is the next um, big area of expansion. Um, the King Cardin project um, was developed by the flotation energy team. And then we brought in uh, Cobra, which is a Spanish EPC, EPC company. And they're now the, the main shareholder. Um, it's five turbines. Um, five 9.5 megawatt machines and a sixth turbine, which is a two megawatt machine, which was installed in 2018. The photo you show there, and I'm happy to share more, is one of those, um, 194 meters high on a very big base. Um, and that is just an amazing engineering feat um, and a great project, a pioneering project, which hopefully we can now push that forward and deliver bigger projects worldwide. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just briefly on our recent success, so um, the UK seabed is effectively owned and managed by the Crown Estate, uh, separate to government. Um, they announced their 
fourth round uh, bidding process and we entered that with Cobra as our JV partner. Uh, that went through an interesting bidding process, uh, which was on a per megawatt per year basis for an option only, not even a lease. Um, and so world record breaking prices um, uh, and the competition, competition included BP for the first time, Total and RWE who are more established developer. Um, so it's very stiff competition. And it really highlights that some of the earlier entry of, BP, of the oil and gas industry in Europe in particular. Uh, US oil and gas majors have yet really to enter with any um, great effect. But when that happens, I think we'll see a, another rapid acceleration of offshore wind. And uh, blowing our own trumpet a little bit, it does demonstrate that we have a capability to identify uh, what we think are highly competitive sites that can compete against that sort of opposition and to win and do that in a cost effective way as well. Um, so very exciting for us in February. Um, and then we followed that up since with a 100 megawatt floating project off Southwest England and a couple more to come as well. Uh, next slide, please. Bringing that back to Australia, um, there's a map there that shows uh, one of the sites we're currently working off, um, off Gippsland. It's further to the north uh, east of Star of the South in amongst oil and gas infrastructure. We've been looking at this for quite a while, since early 2019. Uh, nominally a 1.5 gigawatt bottom fix offshore wind farm, although there is opportunity for floating there further out. You'll notice there's a larger development area and two options. Uh, we're looking, option one is what you might call um, a more recognizable shallow bottom fix site. Um, and option two is pushing that out into deeper water where we get an uplift in wind energy resource and more opportunity to explore energy transition, um, which includes potential reuse of assets onshore and offshore, uh, repurposing of personnel, um, leveraging 50 years plus uh, of data in that region as well. So we've got a lot to go off. Um, it leverages our core expertise that come out of oil and gas, but also um, offshore wind. Um, they're between 10 to 50 kilometers offshore, which reflects the two sites. And from the shallow, it's about 20 meters uh, out to 50 meters uh, and a little bit beyond. Um, it provides an opportunity for the energy transition and the site supply chain transformation. There's a hundred years worth of uh, energy legacy in the region, 50 years of oil and gas, which means there's a lot of capability, uh, but that infrastructure offers that sort of a um, brownfield is not the right word but a site where there is previous development again which we can leverage um, we've done a lot of work in the background a lot of design work consultation environmental assessments and we're moving towards uh, referrals now and of course um, proactive community engagement and we're more than happy to receive feedback um, you'll see this map here and further details coming out in the next few weeks uh, as well um, Next slide, please. That gives you a very brief overview of us, of the project. I'm happy to have any questions and I would just encourage fellow developers on the call and others to maintain the conversation, look for opportunity to cooperate and see if we can deliver um, a sustainable industry in Australia. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. So we're getting very close to the end of the session and we've had lots and lots of questions that have been posed both collectively of, of our panelists and individually to our panelists and a number of those have been answered as we've gone. Uh, so I'm going to cheat. What I'm gonna do is I've got three questions that I've seen come up a number of times and I'm gonna pose the three questions and then I'm gonna to go to each of our panelists one by one and invite them to address the one of those three questions that they find the most interesting. So um, the three issues that have come up consistently since the start have been, I think, um, design life and decommissioning. So we know there's a contemporary issue in the blue economy around the future of offshore oil and gas platforms and what the approach to decommissioning of those should be. As we design these new uh, fixed and floating systems, are we thinking already about what happens at the end of their life? So that's the first question. The second question is around the opportunity to work with other major users 
in the blue economy in a complementary way. And this is something that the CRC has been looking at. So uh, what exploration have you done? What opportunities might you see to work in a complementary way with seaweed aquaculture or off offshore uh, finfish aquaculture um, or commercial shipping? So is that something you've been thinking about? And the third question goes to hydrogen. Uh, have you given any thought to opportunities around offshore generation and storage of hydrogen as a way of converting offshore renewable wind into a source that can be applied by other users in the blue economy itself or subsequently transported? So I'd invite each panelist to take one of those questions. You can all take the same one if you want to, um, but just the, the one of those questions that you find the most interesting. So I'm going to start with, with you, David, because you kicked us off. Uh, which of those three questions is of the most interest to you and, and what would you like to tell us in relation to it? Well, I would say it's a, it's a combination of the, the first and the third one uh, in terms of what's the, the future for, for the oil and gas assets and, and also uh, potential I mean, use of hydrogen and, and also because I see a clear combination between both of them. Uh, we are we are now involved uh, in in a, in a couple of projects where we are looking to uh, let's say provide power uh, to to existing oil and gas assets. Uh, it's not exactly what's happening in Australia with the commission of, of these assets, but it's it's also um, a way that there's a let's say a clear uh, a clear intention from from the oil and gas managers and the asset owners to green in somehow the, the production of, of oil and gas. Uh, and let's say this, this combination of floating offshore wind uh, with floating uh, oil and gas assets, it's, it's a, a clear combination to see some steps towards um, the greener let's say, production of, of oil and gas. But, but then when it comes to the, the commission of, of these, these assets, uh, I think it's, it's a Clear opportunity for hydrogen. So let's say it's having the same structure, the same layout of uh, floating wind farms connected to these oil and gas assets to uh, to change the use of these this power being generated by floating offshore wind into a, an even more greener and an even more blue uh, economy, right? Which would be the, the production of hydrogen uh, in, in these let's say oil and gas assets and avoiding the commissioning of those assets and, and, and taking the opportunity. We, we, we need to always to, to look at the, the permitting process and, and how these will work. And so I'll, I guess also this the commissioning goes uh, aligned with uh, exp exploration of, of some of the, the permitting that, that we'll, we'll see there. Uh, but I guess there's a, a great opportunity to be looked at. And, and, and it's something that's happening in, well, said we are involved in operating in Canada. Um, we are seeing opportunities in, in the Mediterranean Sea, now uh, in Australia. So it's a worldwide opportunity. Great, thanks, David. Uh, so now, Aaron, I'm gonna go to you. Uh, which of those questions are you liking? Are you liking what happens to our assets at the end of, our li of their life? What are we thinking about? Are you liking uh, opportunities to work in a complementary way with other emerging users out there, or is your preference to tackle hydrogen, or are you going to cheat a bit like David and combine a couple? <laughs> no, I'm going to uh, respect the time we've got here and actually use it as a, as a call to action. So to, to focus on the collaboration aspect, we are really open to hearing from people. As I mentioned during my presentation, it is about working together, whether it's an industry, uh, communities or uh, other research agencies. So I really just want to use my time to say, if you'd like to have a conversation with us, if you've got a fantastic idea of how we can combine with some of the other research activities and programs that are ongoing, please drop us a line at staroftheSouth.com.au. You can reach us there, uh, whether a university or a community organisation, uh, please get in touch. We're always open to have that conversation and to keep it going off the back of this uh, webinar series. Fantastic, Aaron. That was excellent. Really appreciate that. Um, Andy, I'm going to throw to you, which of those three questions do you like? Or is there something else that you want to make sure you put on the table today? No, look, they're all great questions. Look, I'll get to the, the hydrogen question. I'll probably just put a different take on things. I mean, certainly, 
Um, green hydrogen production is a key thing on everyone's agenda at the moment. Uh, look, for us, it's probably a little bit longer term. I think there's some uh, more viable shorter term uh, opportunities in the hydrogen space, which are more around commonality of supply chain, investors investment, and I think as David touched on around offshore oil and gas capabilities to then really bring on offshore wind in a much more accelerated way, which will also accelerate the opportunities for green hydrogen production. So uh, look, it's something that we all look at. That's why for those listening in, we're all looking at large scale projects so you can accelerate other industries. I think particularly around hydrogen, and it's part of our discussions where members and consistent speakers of the Port Campbell Hydrogen Hub and the Newcastle Hydrogen Hub, we focus very much on the commonality of supply chain and investor and investment opportunities so that we can make production a lot more viable sooner rather than later. Great. Thanks, Andy. Fantastic contribution. Um, Dan, what's, what's the perspective you'd like to share? <laughs> um, well, all of them are relevant questions. I think there is a lot of commonality to be explored. It's still early days. Uh, the one that I sort of feel most interested in is that uh, we're, we're very focused on, on floating uh, offshore wind for a number of reasons. We can go further out, we can catch more wind, but most importantly, the environmental footprint is much less. And also the, the, the increasing focus on the decommissioning of gas plants and the threat of, uh, of, uh, op of bonds to be put in place, decommissioning bonds of substantial value up front. And, uh, it, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a scary uh, uh, scenario. So uh, offshore floating uh, is also a, a, a neater way to go as we can tow them back to shore when they're obsolete. That's great. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, Brad, over to you. Uh, look, I, I like both. Uh, I like all the questions, but I actually view question one and question two as part of a continuum. Um, you know, our focus on uh, the generation of clean energy is not just the energy electron that we're generating at the moment, but its entire life cycle footprint. So um, uh, without, you know, taking into consideration issues of design life and decommissioning, and then what I call co-commit and use or um, uh, conjunctive activity use around offshore wind, we see that as, you know, looking at the overall development as a virtuous cycle. We don't want to be developing new energy projects that we claim are green today that are just kicking a design life and decommissioning issue can down the road um, because that's what the oil and gas industry is trying to walk away from in many respects. Um, uh, you know, just in case a lot of people don't know, you know, the oil and gas legislation, um, NOPSEMA, um, those original licenses that signed by all the oil and gas producers required 100% removal of everything on the seafloor. And the oil and gas industry has extracted billions of dollars of profits out of the Commonwealth, Commonwealth assets, because they are Commonwealth assets. They're not owned by the oil and gas companies. Um, and they're now trying to retrade that deal saying, oh gosh, we didn't realize it was going to be this expensive to remove everything from the surface, the sea bottom. Um, we have to think about it that way as we look at offshore wind um, to make sure that what we're installing, how we, and whether it's what's on the seafloor all the way up to the turbine blades, you know, those have to be recycled. Something has to be done with them. So we do have to look at it in a holistic sense um, that it is truly clean energy in a 360 degree um, uh, uh, view, purview, um, and is also done in a way that we actually are creating um, uh, more opportunity for that cooperation. Um, you know, uh, many, many years ago, um, uh, I wanted to become a marine biologist, so I'm just getting back to what I always wanted to do. Um, with uh, applying that, uh, that passion I had all those years ago to uh, looking at offshore wind. Good on you, thanks, Brad. And um, Tim, take us out. Lucky last. Um, three good questions. 
uh, echo what Aaron said around the research side of things. Um, I guess mine's a combination of one and two, design life from decommissioning and opportunity to work with other users. Um, certainly in the UK from Morecambe Bay project, uh, we're looking at asset reuse, but also opportunities to work with oil and gas to improve the way we do things. Um, we're taking development timeframes from eight to 10 years down to five years for that project and others. In fact, in terms of overlapping work packages, um, leveraging the data we have in that environment and the same applies to Gippsland where we've got a lot of data already there, a lot of geotechnical seabed type information that we can work off and taking other practices. That's not to say oil and gas know how to do offshore wind. I'd suggest they probably don't, forgive me for saying that. They're two very different prospects, two very different infrastructure projects. Uh, and there's certainly a, a, a way to work together there. Um, and then ultimately to find a very environmentally sustainable solutions. Um, my last point is, aside the cooperation, is to leverage off all the lessons learned in Europe in particular. There's been 30 years of oil and gas. Let's not forget that. Let's not repeat mistakes of the past. And they're going into decommissioning of offshore wind structures now. So there's a lot to learn and bring to Australia to accelerate things going forward. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. That's a great note to finish on. Uh, look, everyone that's participating in Tasmania and the rest of Australia and around the world, really want to thank you for, for attending today. Uh, it wasn't our intention necessarily to be the first ones to provide this sort of forum, but it's fantastic to hear from from our panelists today that this is the first time they've seen this sort of thing happen. And if the CRC can help these conversations start and be sustained in our community, then I think that's a, a great role we can play. So to all our panelists, thanks for being so deeply reflective on the subject matter, to answering so openly and honestly the questions that were posed, to truncating um, amazing professional experience and amazing projects into five and six minute, minute grabs. And to all of those who took the time to attend and send in questions, we thank you. Uh, please check back regularly to the CRC website to get details of, of upcoming webinars. A recording of this one will be available on our website in the, the coming days on our event page. And just before I close, I do want to make special thanks uh, to Leslie, who behind the scenes has run the whole thing, um, lined us up as panellists beforehand so we understood exactly who needed to do what, has run uh, all the slides and has supported the chat and the Q&A function. So Leslie, special thank you to you. And so wherever you are in the world, have a good morning, have a good afternoon, have a good night, and we hope to see you at the next one of these in the future. Thanks very much. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.